Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Merlin Oltoff. He is a postdoc in Tipping Points in Treatment at the University of Groningen and a lecturer in Pedagogical Sciences at Redbaud University. His work focuses on complex systems, clinical psychology, developmental psychopathology, and some other related topics, and today we're talking mostly about a complex systems approach to psychopathology. So, Merlin, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me. So, just before we get into psychopathology itself, I know that you're also interested in, and this is something that also applies to psychopathology as well, you're interested in studying behavioral variability within individuals. So, do you think that uh, standard research practices in psychology are well equipped to doing this? Um, yes, that is that is sort of a tricky question. I, th I think in general not, and everyone will agree with that. Uh, probably be because standard for, for quantitative research in, in psychology, it's kind of the standard to use statistical methods. I also use statistical methods. It's not uh, very easy to avoid, but they are not, uh, they are not well equipped for the dependencies that you find in the, in the data at the within person level. So, um, yeah, every, every process that you could measure in, in psychology, if you take a dynamic systems perspective on it, then every future instance of something like what you think or how you feel is generated from how you felt or how you felt in the past. And this creates the kinds of dependencies that make, uh, the, that make uh, the data uh, not so easy to handle for statistical methods that we, that we generally use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, getting into a complex systems approach to psychopathology, I mean, a complex systems theory, I've already talked about it several times before on the show, so I, I think we can leave that aside. But applying it specifically to psychopathology, perhaps it would be good for us to go through some conceptual foundations here. I think that would be a good way of introducing the topic. So, could you tell us first, what are critical fluctuations? Um, yeah, critical fluctuations are very specific uh, phenomena in complex uh, phenomena in complex systems. Um, yeah, they are large and large fluctuations that you can observe close to a tipping point uh, if if the system undergoes uh, bifurcation and. Those critical fluctuations are studied transdisciplinary in, in research on complex systems. Um, originally, uh, many studies in, in, in physics or natural sciences, of course. Um, in the in psychology or in the clinical psychology literature, they have been studied for quite some time in, in psychotherapy research, especially. So, Many various psychotherapy researchers started to hypothesize, I think, mostly starting in the 1980s, that that patients in psychotherapy also underwent a kind of phase transition and that destabilization, or the, so the, 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 the existing attractor becoming unstable, was an essential part of therapy. And this destabilization uh, leads to the critical fluctuations. There are often these uh, ball and valley models, if the valley gets flatter, so the, the existing state, so the pathological state in which someone was in becomes more unstable, then you see more fluctuations. And that has been studied with many with observation methods, like coding therapy conversations. And then there was more, uh, yeah, people found things like more variability in the emotions that, uh, that were spoken of in the therapy sessions. Um, and what I did in my research is also looked at critical fluctuations in uh, daily self-rating data. So people in therapy completed a questionnaire on a daily basis in which they answered various questions about the therapy process. 
with a slider, so from zero to 100. How, how well did you feel today or how much progress did you feel you made? Things like that. And then we really try to test if fluctuations in those scores over time would be an, uh, a warning signal for an upcoming transition, which we then defined as a sudden change in symptom severity from one day to another. Um, yeah. Uh, and so at a certain point there, you mentioned another concept that I would like to ask you more about. So uh, what is this stabilization exactly? Mm, yeah, I've, so there are a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of terminology in complex systems and I think people may use terms slightly uh, differently. But for me, destabilization is the process of an existing attractor becoming unstable. Mm -hmm. So that's usually as a consequence of a, of a control parameter change. Um, and if the previous attractor is a point attractor, then the increasing instability will lead to, to two observable phenomena. So the first one is this critical fluctuation, so fluctuations increase. And the second one is critical slowing down, that it takes more time to return to the existing state after a perturbation. So if you would think about uh, psychopathology, it could be that if someone is very severely depressed, mm -hmm. then a person can only feel joy for a very short moment, like maybe laugh about a joke. You can debate about whether it's real joy, but um, if you would have critical slowing down, these moments that, that someone feels uh, a bit better mm -hmm. will be longer and longer. Um, because it takes more time to go back to the to the existing depressed state. So that would be an example of how you could see critical slowing down in the psychopathology context. So another concept, uh, order transitions, what are those? Um, yeah, so that, that refers to the, to the tipping points that I mentioned. I think I already <laughs> also said so transition. So if a, if a system uh, changes from one being dominated by one attractor to another, uh, then that's often called a phase transition or critical transition or order transition. Um, and as I said, terminology is often used interchangeably. I also did that in my past papers. I think I used four different names for <laughs> what I see as the same thing. Um, but the interesting thing about these transitions from one attractor to another is that uh, that they are very often relatively abrupt because um, yeah, be, because as long as there is an attractor, the system will be kept being attracted to it. And once the previous one is gone, there will always be, in living systems, there will always be a new one that then immediately attracts the state of the, the system. So these transitions often go, uh, go pretty fast. And so uh, in psychopathology, one of the things that people study is early warning signals to try to potentially detect uh, a psychopathology before it's full blown, be before people st really start having full blown symptoms of it, for example. Um, what are these early warning signals and how have they been study studied? Yeah, as I see it, there are two early warning signals, critical fluctuations and critical slowing down, okay. uh, which are then the consequence of destabilization. And they are studied, yeah, we use, in my research group, we use the term early warning indicators to differentiate between the theoretical concept and the measure. So the early warning indicators are usually statistical indicators that can pick up on either the fluctuations or the increased return time. So most uh, often used are variance and autocorrelation, in which autocorrelation relates to the return time of critical slowing down, and variance uh, picks up both, actually. So that's also why, why uh, not all bodies of literature differentiate between critical fluctuations and critical slowing down, um, which is fine by me. Uh, the destabilization is the, is the underlying uh, process. So yeah, there are these early warning indicators and in psychopathology, they have often been applied to, uh, to self ratings, to daily self ratings or experience sampling data. 
So people experience sampling is when people multiple times per day answer uh, questions on the slider, usually about uh, how they feel, um, maybe about their symptoms. And um, yeah, they've been studied in a, in a wide variety of ways. And I think the research field does not yet have a consensus about what is the best way to approach it. Um, so in a sense, the older psychotherapy studies that I mentioned that looked at instability in the therapy sessions, um, yeah, they also look at, at instability as precursor of change, but not with the early warning signal uh, uh, frame, so to say. Mm -hmm. And But now you see many studies uh, taking this frame of early warning signals, for instance, one study that, that I did. And that also has to do, of course, with the review paper by Martin Schaeffer and this group about early warning signals in, in a wide variety of complex systems. And indeed, the, the kind of promise that it, that it can have for people is that you could uh, use it to prevent uh, the transition towards a full-blown disorder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But actually, the, the early warning signals are not very predictive at the individual level, or at least not yet. And also, um, yeah, I don't know if, if, if um, I think prediction is also not really the aim of the early warning signals in the, in the clinical psychology context. Because actually, the, the early warning signals are not just warning for something that is coming up, but they are indicating something that's happening in the moment, which is the destabilization. Right. Um, and the destabilization does not have to always lead to a transition. That's only in, in, in the very paradig paradigmatic <laughs> transitions that are studied. Um, that's mostly in experimental context, and there's a constant change in the control parameter and the control parameter uh, is, a, is a variable or, or a summary of variables that pushes the system through destabilization to the transition. So for instance, if you have ferromagnetization, that's when you cool certain materials to a very low temperature, they, uh, they start to generate a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. You can lower this temperature continuously and at first you see the critical fluctuation slowing down and then you see the transition happening. Um, so, for clinical change, the early warning signals would be nicely predictive if A, we can measure them well, which is of course always uh, an issue in, in quantitative research on psychology, uh, but B, if there is this continuous changing control parameter that is really pushing the system through this transition, and I think uh, that's not very realistic for the for the psychology, uh, clinical psychology case. Uh, for instance, in psychotherapy, um, people, the psychotherapy process, of course, kind of tries to, to do that. But I think there are also all kinds of mechanisms that prevent a destabilization to, to uh, result in a transition, so to say. There's also research showing in psychotherapy that during this instability, people experience more negative emotions, more variable emotions. I tend to also see instability in the therapy context as maybe a phase in which uh, in which people really are facing their problems or are confronted with their problems in a certain way. And 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 the, that, that generates these negative feelings and that, that creates all sorts of mechanisms to not transition because people may want to avoid this uh, or there simply may be no more desirable attractive to go to, maybe uh, uh, that that's not possible in that in that moment. So, but then I think in in the clinical psychology context, if you realize um, in in therapy, for instance, that you are in this uh, instability phase, it is of course clinically useful to know that either uh, also when it does not predict a change, but you can try to use this instability to kind of explore what other possible phases may be possible uh, get some ideas about it and work with it 
-hmm. So work with the instability without using it as a predictor. Mm -hmm. So just before we move on to another topic, just to perhaps summarize a little bit what you said there, because uh, you talked about some of the limitations of how the studies surrounding early warning signals have been conducted, uh, some of the limitations they have, and perhaps uh, some of the goals that people have with them, or perhaps uh, how they interpret them uh, sometimes is not the the best way or something like that. So uh, what would you say are perhaps uh, ways of improving the ways we study early warning signals and uh, what we should expect from that and how basically we could use information coming from uh, those studies? Um, yeah, that's a hard question. Mm -hmm. I think for sure it's it's really good to have multiple approaches so people taking different angles on it and, uh, and, and and trying things out but I think it also helps to make the theory more more clear so what and, and make the assumptions more explicit and then I also mean especially the theoretical assumptions so we are also working on that uh, together uh, with um, Jingmang Chui, Annalise Bakashov and uh, Fred Hasselman and Jing Meng is, is taking a bit of a mathematical perspective to make these assumptions explicit so that we need to have a point attractor before the transition and that the early warning signals need to be observed just before the transition, not too far before and also not during the transition because then they're also not, uh, not indicating the dest uh, destabilization anymore. Um, and that you should uh, observe the warning signal in the same set of variables as the transition. Um, so there are, I think there are some theoretical advances to be made, advancements. Uh, also methodological, of course, so there are different early warning indicators, which one work best, or, or can we combine them, or do different ones work better in, in different scenarios. Um, so we, yeah, we have the theory improvements, conceptualization, method improvements, and I, I also think it's good to have, yeah, maybe some, yeah, what you could call pragmatic Im improvements. So, yeah, what are the exact context in which we could use early warning signals, and how could how could detection of destabilization really benefit individuals? So, I think in the psychotherapy context, especially if you have an intensive psychotherapy, for instance, in inpatient clinic. And then you can immediately uh, work with this kind of information. And there are also some therapists that are already doing that, but mm -hmm. there's not uh, there's not been a systematic study yet about how how they use it and uh, and what are their experiences and experience of their patients. And I think that would also be uh, very valuable. Um, yeah, and then. Other contexts, if you have the, like the more massive prevention context, uh, like the R&D project of, uh, of Eiko Fried, where he tries to, to predict, uh, I think, mood uh, disorders in students. And I think it's also worthwhile to uh, to explore if, uh, if, if you can maybe uh, pick out individuals that you can then help a bit earlier. Um, but I think it's always very important to 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 think about the real practical benefit of this field and and to discuss that with the people involved. So the the persons that we are are trying to uh, to study, so patients or either people that that, mm -hmm. that study for preventive purposes, and the therapists or other caregivers that have to. Yeah, that will do something with the information about whether a person is in this instability. And then it may turn out uh, that only in very specific context, this uh, early warning studies are view added value in, in clinical psychology. So could you tell us now about sudden gains and losses? There is large shifts in symptom severity 
in patients receiving some sort of psychotherapy? I mean, how can we understand those sudden gains and losses? Uh, yes, that's a very interesting uh, uh, case of the sudden gains and losses. So, uh, actually, when I was a master student, I started to work on, on my study on, er on early warnings in psychotherapy. And because the early warning should predict a phase transition from one attract to another, I was looking for abrupt shifts in symptom surety because I learned that the phase transition is an abrupt shift. I was not very much uh, into the clinical psychology field yet. And then I found out about these sudden gains and losses, which is a super large uh, research field. Probably my, my supervisors then send it to me. Um, so these abrupt shifts in symptom severity are really, really common. Um, and they also have been quite a mystery for a long time. So initially it was discovered with uh, session-based or weekly symptom ratings during therapy, uh, cognitive therapy for depression. So what the authors found, uh, I think in 1999, is that uh, that people often improved suddenly and, and barely gradual. Mm -hmm. And then they had this theory about how that had to do with depression and with, with cognitive restructuring. Right. But then other studies found these certain gains also for other diagnoses, for other therapies. There are also studies that show that certain gains occur with pharmacological treatments, also with placebo treatments, also for people who are not patients at all. So it seems to be something really, really general and that, uh, of course, fits the idea of a, of a critical transition in, in complex systems, because this is uh, really a general principle uh, of change. And um, yeah, so I think that's really, at least in, in the treatment context, that's a really interesting candidate to study as a phase transition or formulate hypothesis that can test that ID. So for instance, uh, to observe critical fluctuations. Um, what I'm recently, I'm wondering about, but I need to <laughs> need to read into that more, is that if I look at the reviews for the sudden gains, then, you, then they say in about 30 to 60% of patients. But I think that's also in general, the number of patients that, that generally benefits from psychotherapy. And if I look at some data that I used, also I barely see these gradual change profiles. So I'm actually wondering um, if, if not almost all change in psychotherapy is relatively sudden and if the gradual change that I think many psychological researchers may assume implicitly, maybe that's a super rare uh, phenomenon. Uh, and so, moving on to another topic, we've talked about uh, complex, uh, complex systems approach to psychopathology earlier. Uh, but in psychopathology research, uh, the focus has been a lot on group-based disease model. So, in trying to perhaps uh, make the shift from one to the other, what would you say are the main differences between these two type of approaches and what are some of their main strengths and uh, limitations? Um, yeah, so group-based uh, approaches versus complex systems approaches. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, the, so the, the, with the group-based approaches, we, we write about that in the in our theoretical paper uh, briefly. Um, but what, what we mean with that is the classical studies in which we take a, uh, a sample of people with a certain diagnosis, for instance, depression or psychosis or, or whatever, and a sample of people without the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And then by comparing these, these samples on uh, usually as one or two uh, variables, the group-based approaches try to, to find information about uh, what makes that this one population, so people with the diagnosis, is different from the healthy population. Mm -hmm. um, very often this kind of research is also framed in searching underlying causes. So if, 
if on average these two groups have uh, different brain activity in fMRI or different uh, anatomical, anatomical differences in the brain, then these differences are often uh, proposed to be possible underlying causes for why there are these different uh, populations. So what this these group-based approaches try to do is something rather static to, to differentiate two groups of people and to try to understand uh, possible causal yeah, causes for why they are different. Um, so the psychopathology becomes something really static and, and an essence of certain people. And in the complex systems approach, uh, psychopathology is more like a process so it's, uh, it changes over time. It has no specific underlying cause because it's generated by self-organization. So that means that all kinds of processes throughout the person environment system uh, interact and that these interactions lead to a pattern formation without an underlying cause and that then this pattern is, for instance, psychopathology. Um, so we ask we conceptualize psychology very different and, and then also ask different questions. Um, yeah. So the questions that we ask is what, what are the principles of change? How does psychology emerge? Uh, how can transitions toward different states uh, take place? Uh, yeah, things like that. Uh, but do you look at these two different kinds of approaches as potentially complementary? Or they, do they can they complement one another, or do you see them as? I, I mean, since you come more from the side of complex systems theory, do you think that uh, that approach should replace the other, or how do you look at it exactly? Yeah, yeah, I think the complex systems approach should replace. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should be the. Yeah, I don't know, I, it doesn't need to be the main approach, but I think the group based, um, yeah, there are of course differences in group based approaches, but the whole idea of, of uh, the, I disagree with the conceptualization that, that mm -hmm. the assumptions that lay behind uh, this research, although the researchers that, that perform such studies may, may not always have these assumptions like themselves and may and may, may want to uh, uh, they may have, have similar goals as I have but I, I um, so I don't agree with the conceptualization that psychology is something static and an, and an essence of a certain population mm -hmm. um, and also I do not not uh, think that the, the causality adds up. So the the additivity assumption that that lays behind this research. So if you find an, a difference between this group and the other one, then the the additivity assumption is that you find part of the cause why they are different because usually the effect size is not very large, but you found at least uh, to put it metaphorically a puzzle piece that helps you explain why why healthy people are different from from people with certain diagnosis. And then the assumption of this research field uh, is that if if they find a lot of, of small causes in the absence of a larger one, that you can still add them up and then explain the difference. And instead of additivity, the complex systems approach assumes interaction, not multiplicative, multiplicative interactions. So all these uh, pieces that you find are actually not pieces, but processes that are interacting uh, all over the place. And because they are interacting so massively, you cannot isolate their contributions to the pattern that you try to explain. And also on a more empirical note, if you look at the, the whole research program that tries to find biological uh, causes for mental disorders, we have to conclude that, that it's very unsuccessful. There are no biological causes found. Um, sometimes wild claims are made about uh, possible biological causes, but if, if you then look at the effect size 
and uh, what it really tells you on the individual level. So if you can, for instance, see from a brain scan if someone has ADHD or not, then the results are super disappointing. So I think that also gives us a clue that perhaps there is no such thing as, as these simple underlying causes and that we really need this interaction perspective uh, from complex systems um, to think about causality which then becomes uh, a way more complicated issue, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, coming again from a complex systems theory approach, could you explain what it means to say that psychopathology is an emergent phenomenon? What does that mean exactly? Um, yeah, that means that you... Uh, that means that it has... Uh, you cannot and attribute the psychology to a smaller part of the person environment system. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's something that we can define as the person environment system as a whole, um, but you cannot point to more, you cannot reduce it to a lower level. So you cannot say, okay, for instance, this brain region is psychopathological and that's why the person is having psychopathology, but it's really right. an attribute of the whole. Yeah. And what about self-organization? Uh, how does that concept apply to psychopathology in the context of complex systems theory? What does it mean to say that uh, psychopathology has, is self-organized? Yeah, for me, self-organization and emergence go uh, hand in hand. And also, mm -hmm. is, in my perspective, really what, what defines complex systems. So what complex systems do is that they form patterns that mm -hmm. are not prescribed by an underlying cause. Um, so the patterns arise from the, the components in the system themselves. Yeah. And that's why you, you call it self-organization. And this also makes that the patterns are not reducible to a lower level. So mm -hmm. a very uh, famous example is uh, bird, bird flocks, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, one that I really like. So if you have a bird flock, then you see this macro level pattern, uh, which is really a property of the flock, not of the individual birds. And there's also not one bird instructing the others how to generate this pattern. There's not one bird saying, okay, you guys go to the left and we go to the right, and then we find each other in the middle. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's purely from the interactions, from the self-organization that this pattern arises. Uh, and I like this example because you can immediately see that it's not uh, not reducible. But I think similarly about uh, psychological states, so to say. I think they arise from the interactions between uh, a lot of system components. Um, and they're not reducible to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you about one last topic here. Just also to try to have a broader view of some of the implications that adopting a complex systems theory approach to psychopathology would have. So what would you say would be the, some, uh, the main implications for the way we classify mental disorders and for how we approach public health, for example? Um, yeah, so for classification, the, the complex systems approach yeah, does not really support any any type of classification. Mm. Uh, one imp important aspect of, of complex systems is that they uh, develop from their interaction history. So um, from, from the moment the system, you know, comes in existence, the interactions of the initial stage generate the future state, and then there are also interactions with the environment, of course. And this goes on and on and on. And through this interaction history, because everyone moves through different environments, um, uh, there's a lot of individuality growing. So people become, as they grow older, is the idea some developmental psych psychologists have also worked on this, and they get more and more individual. Um, so this means that if you have similar diagnosis like depression, 
uh, that every person with a depression has their own depression that emerged somehow from their interaction history. Um, and it's also interesting if you look at uh, their studies done on looking at uh, variability of, of uh, if you only look at symptoms already, then you see uh, for people with depression that they have many, many different uh, symptom profiles. So they have very unique manifestations. We also had a, have done a study in which patients with depression and anxiety at the beginning of treatment draw a network of things that were important to them and their uh, their psychopathology uh, and there we also found huge individuality so this this individual individuality is really explained from complex systems by this uh, interaction history approach uh, um, uh, interaction history uh, id mm -hmm. and so it gives no it gives no scientific basis really for classification. Um, so I think a classification system ideally should be something that is practically useful for uh, caregivers, mm -hmm. and we should be very careful with how to think about diagnosis because very often you see a phenomenon called re reification, so that. A diagnosis, although it's only for the instance of DSM, it's purely descriptive, but very often diagnosis is used as a causal explanation. Like I have, I am, uh, I'm very active because I have ADHD. Uh -huh. um, but the reason that you then have ADHD is that because you're very active, because you get the diagnosis based on the symptoms you have. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's not very useful if we have that that circular. A reification mm -hmm. going on and, and there are also some harms to that mm -hmm. so yeah then i would so i would say yeah for, for classification we should have something useful and that is not confusing description with uh, calls right um yeah that's also part of the public health question of course mm -hmm. um yeah and then there are various more implications to to make. Um, so more for public health, it's very important to, to also emphasize the environment part of the person environment system. So um, problems, problems for mental health, they emerge in, uh, in a person in a certain environment. Yeah. And it might very well be that in a different environment these these problems would not emerge, and that means that uh, interventions and especially prevention can also very much be aimed at the environment, <coughs> which is also interesting. Um, so this individuality I talked about. So I, I, I guess our brains are very individual. The way we feel, we think, are very individual mm -hmm. uh, parts of of. Uh, we as complex systems, but in the environment, there are certain structures that affect a lot of people at the same time. So, uh, if you would, if you would want to point to something like an underlying or common cause for mental health problems, then in the complex systems framework, the more common causes, in the sense uh, processes that that contribute to the psychology of a lot of people like they're not causes in the in the classical sense but contribute for a lot of people uh, I think there would be things like uh, poverty for instance or if people are in uh, in serious debts um, uh, unemployment so um, yeah I think that's a very so theoretical implication of the theory would be that it would be very worthwhile for public health uh, to to look at these social cultural things that often go together with mental health problems and try to intervene there. So yeah, I don't know maybe things like uh, basic income, mm -hmm. uh, uh, releasing people from their debts, yeah. things like that. Okay, great. So uh, let's end the interview here, Merlin. Uh, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? 
Um, yeah, good question. I guess Google, Google Scholar would be the best uh, place to search. And we have a complex, uh, yeah, we have a research group for complex systems, uh, mostly focusing on, on psychology and on youth care. Mm -hmm. And we are building a new website. Um, but uh, we have a group page on the website of Radboud University. Uh, and otherwise, uh, yeah. I hope people will find the website sometime. You can also follow me on uh, Twitter. And also my supervisors are there uh, for my PhD project. So Fred Hasselman and uh, Anna lichtwerk Ashoff. Okay, great. I'm leaving links to that in the description box of the interview. And thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank you uh, for me as well. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description down below. And also please share, like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters Perga Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunde, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andre, Francis Forte, Agnunes, Fergal Cousin, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Nyar, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hummel, Sadus France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Anik Punta, Radana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madsen, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiesman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stiofanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Morey, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheist, Larry Dealey Jr., Old Herringbone, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Paul Crowleys, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hurtner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings and David Pinsoff. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefaniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alni Cortes, Nick Golden and Rosie. And to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.